Hi, I'm Riley Moynes, author of The Four Phases of Retirement and its sequel, The Ten Lessons. We're speaking with people who are squeezing all the juice out of their retirement. People with widely divergent backgrounds, experience, and expertise. People with stories that can inspire and encourage you, too, to squeeze all the juice out of your retirement. Thanks for joining us for today's conversation. Here we go. My guest today is Dr. Ken Schonk. He was a family physician for over 35 years until his retirement in 2007. He now works one day a week doing occupational health. In 1988, he attended a seminar run by the Humor Project out of Saratoga, New York, and then began a public speaking career with an emphasis on humor in medicine. Over the last 15 years, he has made nearly 1,000 presentations to medical conventions, service clubs, probus clubs, and a whole range of others. These range from half-hour talks to half-day seminars for groups from 50 to 2,000 in number. In his presentation, he explores the uses of humor in physician health, stress management, relationships, parenting, and the aging process. His messages are liberally sprinkled, as you'll see, with lousy jokes he refers to as mirthful messages. He also works hard to show that there ain't much fun in medicine, but there's lots of medicine in fun. Again, thanks for joining me today. You're welcome, Riley. Glad to be here. Let's talk a little bit about your medical career. Give us the Reader's Digest Reader's view Digest. of that one. Uh, I, I guess I would be considered in the old type of family doctors now uh, because I did obstetrics, I delivered about 1,500 babies. I did make house calls. Uh, I looked after inpatient hospital. Uh, I assisted on surgery. Um, the newer, younger physicians now are mostly doing office practice. Uh, but I, it also gave me a wonderful um, agenda of, of, of a variety of things from mm-hmm. patients that I've learned over the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, have shared their good moments and obviously some of their bad moments sure. as well. Mm-hmm. I did do locums for about 10 years after retiring in 2007 where I filled in for doctors who had vacations or were sick. Right. Uh, I stopped doing that about four or five years ago mm-hmm. and I'm just doing the occupational health now. Right. So uh, it's, and it my, in fact, we just today made reservations for our 50th class medical reunion at Western, uh, nice. which will be next November, next nice. October. Nice. Now, tell me the background about how you got interested in incorporating humor into medicine. I know it goes back a number of years. Yeah. Well, we had a lot of humor at home, uh, my mother especially, but I had a particular incident that sort of, uh, one of those aha moments uh, around 88. Uh, it was about a week before Christmas. I was having a bad day in the office. I was behind. I had a headache. I walked into an examining room to find a five- or six-year-old boy that had been brought in by his mother. He'd been up all night with an earache, and he was not a happy camper. Mm. And when I walked in, I found him already under the examining table screaming. And I thought, oh, this is going to improve my day. <laughs> I managed to get him out with a bit of wrestling, cajoling. I got a look in his ears. But I knew he was upset. So I turned to him and I said, now what did you ask Santa for Christmas next week? He looked me straight in the eye and said, a new doctor. (laughs) And I went to write up his chart and I thought, my headache's pretty much gone. I feel better. And I realized that that few (laughs) seconds of laughter completely changed my mood. It realized I was going to make it through the day. Uh, And I realized that, yes, I dealt with serious things, but if you can bring some joy into your work, it means that it isn't work. And I used to have a sign on my desk that said, make work feel like play. Uh, and uh, if you can do that, you can actually look forward to coming into work. Right. Yes, you're going to have tough times, but you're also going to have those patients that will are willing to play with you, have some fun. I also very quickly learned that it's a very short leap be- between humor and compassion. That most patients, when they come in to see the doctor, are uptight. They're yes. tense. They're... Sure. Their life has been offset by something. So they're worried about, of course, all the uh, terrible scenarios. And that with a bit of humor, you get them to relax, you relax. I also suggest that if two people share a laugh together, they are equal human beings. They are not doctor and patient, rich and poor, uh, politician and voter. They are equal human beings. It brings it down to the human characteristics. 
And I actually tell when I'm speaking in the public that tell the public to take some humor into their doctors because the doctors themselves are stressed out these days in the the hurry up and wait system. If you bring in some humor, you become human. You're not just a cough. You're not just a back pain. You're not just a rash. You become a human being and you will get better medical care. And I'll give you one other instance of near my retirement, one of my seniors nailed me beautifully. If you'd asked me, I would have said this fellow was a bit of a grouch. I walked into the examining room this particular day to find him already stretched out in the examining room table. He'd taken the sheet we provided and pulled it right over his body, and he'd brought in a sign he'd made up that he'd stuck on his chest that said, too late! (laughs) And I can tell you, he got an extra 20 minutes out of me that day because he made me laugh. And uh, if you take some humor into your doctor, you will get better medical care. (laughs) So your 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 first experience at the uh, at the humor conference yes. in Toronto. Tell us about that and how that yeah. triggered I had, activities. I, I read about it and uh, so I headed off to a conference, uh, for the Humor Project out of New York, uh, and I was impressed uh, with it. Um, one of the speakers was a gal named Dr. Annette Goodhart, a PhD in psychology. She, believe it or not, actually did work humor and laughter therapy with terminally ill and dying cancer patients that they would go in and, with the patient's permission, would share humorous material. An interesting thing was they found the patients were turning down their morphine pumps. Wow. Because we now know with, with and I, I believe it, when I started in 88, I took a fair bit of flack from my medical colleagues. They all said, sure. it's anecdotal, it's not scientific, this is garbage, you know, get out of here. Right. Well, we now have uh, 30 years of research. They've done biochemical experiments to show your endorphin levels go up with laughter and endorphins are a natural painkiller. Mm-hmm. Cortisol levels go down. Uh, they actually have shown the components of the immune system will increase with mirthful laughter and stay up for several days mm-hmm. afterwards. We have a textbook called The Psychology of Humor by Rod Martin. We now have functional MRIs uh, done uh, studies. These are small studies. It's hard to get grant money to study humor. (laughs) But Stanford and Dartmouth have actually done functional MRIs of people while they're laughing to find out what parts of the brain are actually active. And they have found some interesting things. Number one is that uh, the neocortex, usually the right side, interprets the humor, but it is the amygdaloid in, or the insular area that decides whether it's funny or not. So there's two different areas working. They've also found that see, what they call the nucleus acumens lights up. It's the same area that lights up when drug addicts are high. Uh-huh. They've also found a gender difference. Women access their memory and language areas before deciding to laugh. And it may explain why women are not terribly interested in slapstick humor. I've asked a lot of my audiences now how many women have rushed out to see the last Three Stooges movie. <laughs> I haven't had anybody put up their hand yet. Uh, so there are some, we're, we're getting much more information now about the aspects, scientific aspects right. of humor. Right. So I'm able to say to some of these people 30 years ago that said it was anecdotal, it's not a, yeah. anecdotal anymore. Right. Uh, we're starting to realize how much more important it is. So as you transition then from your full time practice, Tell me, how did your activity on the speaking side yeah. uh, increase? How, how did that yeah. come about? Well, I was involved with the Speakers Bureau for a while, but I must admit, most of mine has just been word of mouth. And right. and especially with the service clubs, you do one Probus Club and they like it and they they talk to another one. Lions Club, uh, Kiwanis, Optimist, uh, we've, we've done all that. Mm. Uh, so it's mainly been, been word of mouth. Um, I should mention as well, and I don't think it's got anything to do with it, but in 88, exactly the same, almost the same time I, I went after going to this humor conference, uh, I developed an illness of my own, uh, a very rare illness, uh, a chronic neurological condition called CIDP, which is uh, stands for chronic inflammatory demyeling polyneuropathy. At the time I was diagnosed, there were only, supposedly only 15 cases in North America. And I'm still on medications for that. And actually, my one of my first talks I gave in a wheelchair because uh, I was in a wheelchair for about six weeks and didn't know really whether I'd walk again or not. So I have been dealing with this for the last 30 years as well. Um, and for a while, I have been was doing 30, 40 speaking engagements a year. Uh, and uh, say we're, com- we're coming up to 1,000, but 967 actually right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's mainly been word of mouth. And we're starting to do larger groups. 
Uh, I've been right across Canada. I've, I've spoken in Las Vegas. I've spoken in uh, uh, Jamaica, uh, Luthra, uh, for different conferences, that right. sort of thing. People tend to find uh, they love to start a conference with, with my presentation or end in a conference because it's it's light. People tend to get an uplift from it. Right. So uh, uh, that's sort of where we've been used. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've spoken a couple times to the Ontario Funeral Directors Convention. Now, there's a lively group. But <laughs> you think about it, they spend their entire day in the yes. somber mode. Yes, indeed. And uh, as uh, Winston Churchill said, that in order to deal with the most serious things in life, you must also understand the most amusing. And apparently when they have a, the funeral directors have a convention, they lock up the fire hoses because these guys go bananas. Uh, <laughs> and you can understand it uh, if you're spending all day and I'm sorry for your loss. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> you asked about feedback as well. Yep. And I was involved in a, a program called the COPE program with our local funeral homes. Uh, and I went in about every three or four months and spoke to maybe 60, 80 people that had lost somebody in the previous three or four months. Right. When I was first asked, I thought, boy, that's kind of a tough one. But I, at one particular one, I got some of the nicest feedback I've ever gotten. I had a lady come up to me after my talk, and she said, Doctor, I've been grieving for six years. I'm going to stop tonight. And I realized that she needed someone with a bit of authority, like a physician, to say it's okay to laugh again. And... What I did with these people is say, the fact that you're grieving means you love the people that you lost. If you didn't love me, you wouldn't be grieving. And they go, okay, got it. All right, let's assume the person you lost also loved you. And they look down on you now. What would they want you to be doing? Grieving or laughing? And you can see the lights come on. They would want me to laugh, obviously. Uh, So it sort of, I think, helped to get some of these people transitioning back to using humor and laughter again to to make their lives feel better. Now... I would imagine that when you are speaking to different groups, I know you spoke recently to a medical group out in in, yeah. in Newfoundland, uh, or you're speaking to a probus club, or yeah. I think you mentioned that you were speaking recently at the plowing match. Yes, yes. Uh, you 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 obviously try to tailor yeah. your your message to yeah. the to the audience. Yeah. So it, what what kind of theme or what kind of yeah. message would it hit, have been at the medical yeah. Yeah. convention? The, medi- the medical to- convention was actually on physician health. So the big topic there was physician burnout. Uh, because a lot of physicians, and I've, we've had some in our call group that have just called it quits because they couldn't take um, the frustration. Uh, the frustration is, as a family doctor, you would have somebody in who needed to have an MRI, for instance. And we were waiting four, six months to get these done. And you know it really should be done tomorrow. And so you would end up phoning and pleading and trying to get it done sooner. Uh, and it was very frustrating because you, you'd sure. see the patient suffering. They they made the point that some of these physicians would then take they take time off. They might get therapy. They might go on drugs. They might you know take do yoga or tai chi or something. Try to get back on track. Right. But then you go back to the same system that caused the problem in the first place. So obviously most people would look and say we need to change the system so they don't burn out. And that's where we I, idea is that you try to bring some joy into work. And if you can do that your burnout rate should decrease. If you can actually say, well, I'm going to have some fun today, no matter what happens. Uh, so that, that, but I do, I have some rural roots. I spent six summers on a dairy farmer as a teenager. So I, I feel, I, I know you don't spread manure with a strong wind behind you uh, <laughs> so that uh, I can relate to those groups as well. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I, the, the nuts and bolts of it would be the same, but I tend to tailor it. I've spoken to a lot of religious groups uh, and uh, that, uh, and and actually, we get a lot of humor out of the. the uh, I have a uh, an actual sign that uh, somebody sent me that gets a, a good laugh. It was a Baptist church in South Carolina that had the marquee out front, and it said nine a.m. service, Jesus walks on water. Eleven a.m. service, searching for Jesus. <laughs> that, that I point out to people that if God and Jesus not want us to laugh, then why did they give us the ability to laugh? And why did they put that sign up for us? Right. And Proverbs 17 and 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, a broken spirit dryeth the bones. Uh-huh. So that uh, it's there. <laughs> I think it's an evolutionary skill that we're, they actually have done some research that some of the primates, the bonos and chimpanzees will actually laugh. They grunt, but it's their form of laughter. Yeah. Um, and we, we have been given this ability 
They've also done some studies with kids, and, and Alvin Schultz said that, that laughter is the natural sound of childhood, uh, where they've looked at kids playing in a daycare center or in a playground, and they've had students with stopwatches, and they'll go in, and, and kids that maybe from three to five years of age will giggle one to two to three to four hundred times a day. Yeah. The average adult laughs 12 to 15 times a day. And I tell people, how many have heard the expression, you laugh too long, you laugh too hard, it wasn't all that funny, grow up. Uh, and what you do is condition that out, yes. that laughter out of them. One of my favorites is my wife had a, a grandmother that was re raised in UK, and she vividly remembers as a child, almost every time she laughed, her grandmother would turn to her and said, now stop laughing. If you don't stop laughing, you'll be crying by supper time. And it was that that yeah. idea that yeah. laughter was something terrible. Yeah. Uh, so that we recognize now that this skill is often uh, conditioned out of people, mm -hmm. that we don't use it. Um, and I've talked to some groups where we say, when's the last time you saw George laugh? Oh, back in grade nine phys ed, 1952. And there are people like that, <laughs> yeah. that they just don't have the ability to laugh anymore. And some of the um, <laughs> psychiatrists point out when somebody has absolutely no ability to laugh at all anymore, it's a serious issue that you may have somebody yeah. with a severe case of depression uh, and you have to watch them carefully. You were telling me about the presentation you did recently to the Alzheimer's yes. Society. Yeah. I, uh, I spoke uh, a number of years ago, actually, and uh, got up to speak. And uh, it was a Legion Hall here in Kitchener. And I looked at the audience, and I looked at the wall behind me. I looked at the audience. I looked at the wall behind me. And in big block letters on the wall, it said, lest we forget. And I was speaking to the Alzheimer's Association. <laughs> so I didn't have to say a word. I had another episode where I spoke to a uh, big Catholic church, and I found the place and parked and got my equipment out and went around to uh, go into the church, and there's quite a good lineup. And I thought, well, I've got a really good audience here tonight. And I went up to the front of the line and said, excuse me, I'm the speaker here tonight, to get inside to find out that was the lineup for a bingo game. I was speaking to a much smaller group in another room. Uh, so you can't get too uh, 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 high on yourself uh, when you realize that uh, the, the difference is in that. You don't want to compete with a bingo game at no, the Catholic Church. Not for sure. No. Uh, now, is there a theme that, that runs through, for example, if you're speaking to, let's say, a probus yeah. club, yeah. is there a theme that you tend to use with that group that might be different yeah. from other? A lot of these groups, of course, uh, their motives are not next to probus, but are, tend to be altruistic. A lot of them like uh, Rotary mm -hmm. and, and actually right. a groups. number of years ago, I did get a Paul Harris fellowship from the Rotary Club uh, mm -hmm. for the speaking that I was doing. I felt a bit of a fraud because I got it with Bill Kaufman and uh, uh, one of the Schneider characters. Uh, so I was feeling a little small fish at that point in time. <laughs> but yeah, the theme, um, one of the themes I try to get to people is the ability, and Ethel Barrymore said it when she said, you reach full maturity the first time you have a really good laugh at yourself. Because if you examine that scenario, it means you're comfortable with who you are. If you are concerned about any aspects of your appearance or your mental status, um, you're not going to be able to laugh at yourself. Right. If you can laugh at yourself, then you're comfortable with who you are. And I think that is one of the nicest states to get into, uh -huh. uh, basically. Uh -huh. William James is uh, referred to as the Freud of North America, and I've got both his books in the other room. Uh, they would both chuckle horse. But <laughs> one of the comments he made was that um, the greatest discovery of my generation is that a person can alter their life by altering their attitude. That, And that's something I saw in medicine, that I had people that were terminally ill with a hangnail and other people that were on their deathbed telling me jokes. Wow. Uh, and you go, wait a minute here. Yeah. Uh, I had one particular gentleman who uh, was a quadriplegic. He had, uh, I think he broke his neck when he was 19. He had never been unemployed. He worked as an insurance adjuster. He was known right across Canada. And when he was terminally ill, I made a lot of house calls to see him. And when I came in, he'd spend the first 10 minutes telling me all the jokes he'd heard that week. <laughs> I used to go out to my car and think, I should be paying him. He's doing therapy for me. <laughs> and he actually left money in his will for us to set up. We had talked about it, and we set up a humor project at our local hospital oh. called Joke Junction. 
and his wife helped us. And we have volunteers that come in. Uh, we have carts um, um, with TV cameras that can be wheeled into the patient's bedside, right. and they can watch comedy movies. We have tapes. We have car, you know, all the cartoon books, the Herman. It's on a bit of hiatus right now. It's been moved around a lot, but it's been going about 15 to 20 years now. Right. And we have volunteers that come in for an afternoon and take these around to patients in the hospital. And then they go back a couple hours later and see them feeling better. Yeah. Uh, and they realize that they're actually helping the situation. Yeah. When I came to Kitchener-Waterloo uh, in 1972, there were a little around 600 beds at our local hospital. Uh, it's down to 300 beds now, and the population has tripled. And people oh. go, well, how can that be? Mm -hmm. Well, it means that you're in for a much shorter time, uh, and if you're breathing, they kick you out. Right. Um, so <laughs> there's a lot of stress in hospitals. And the ability to, and all this has been donated. We have had, uh, the Stoma Club has helped us uh, fund it. Uh, that people can, I mean, I can watch comedy movies for free. Uh, yes, you can. And and so, and we've done seminars to help other hospitals set this up as well. Right. And have other hospitals set it up to your yeah. knowledge? Yeah, they have, uh, Ottawa has, London has a cancer clinic. I think in London has. Uh, I don't know about out west, but I, I right. think some of them are getting serious about realizing they need this kind of distraction. I've also, when I speak to physicians, concrete things, what I did in my own office is I had all my examining rooms full of the Herman's cartoon series, Calvin and Hobbes, The Far Side. A lot of, of uh, doctors' offices have the Time magazine, the McLean's, yeah. which has the latest political scandal, the latest suicide bombing, the latest, and you get you just you get so much of that stuff yeah. that you just become numb to it. Uh, I've actually had occasions where I've walked in and the patient's giggling at Herman and I've said, well, what's the problem today? And the patient said, well, I came in depressed, but I feel better already. I said, thank you, Herman. Yeah, I love it. Um, I had joke books for kids. I've gone in where kids, maybe eight or nine, are sitting reading jokes to their, their mother or father. And if you stand back and look at that scenario, you've got parent and child relating, the child's reading, and they're using humor. Yeah. I've also pointed out that if you think about it, when you're reading Herman cartoons, you're not aware of time going by, are you? Right. That they don't even know they've been, they could wait 45 minutes right. and think it's five minutes. Doesn't seem so bad. Because they're uh, totally involved in uh, the humor part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I also have, and I've got them upstairs, uh, I had a great big gun stuffed dog that I had in the practice. And kids that came in that had to have stitches out, had to have a needle. You can't tell them it doesn't hurt. They know it hurts. But you can give them this great big stuffed animal to hold and say, uh, hold this while you have your stitches out. Right. I've actually used it for adults as well. Um, mm. We obviously, you know, we had to do a lot of psychotherapy as well in general practice. And uh, people always complained that we were late. Most often the reason I was late is somebody would make a 10-minute appointment. You'd walk in and say, what's the problem today? And they'd say, I want to kill myself. And you realize it wasn't going to be a 10-minute appointment. Sure. And some of those, the other thing is that you would have somebody that's pouring their emotions out. And, of course, in an Ornum family practice, quite often I would have calls into specialists or other people, and I'd have to go and answer the phone. Right. And you'd walk out leaving somebody with tears coming down their face. I would get this dog and hand it to me and say, hold and hug this while I answer the phone. I'll be right back. Yeah. And you can see them actually smile and, and uh, because it's non-threatening. Sure. Um, I got that idea from this doctor in at Goodhart who did, she actually worked as well with uh, physically and sexually abused children. And what she did was she got this, she had a big stuffed bear called Charlie. She realized that she could get the child to relate to the bear because it was non-threatening. First, once they were comfortable with the bear, you could go back to perhaps touching humans again. So it was sort of a transition state. Um, and I found it was quite useful in the office. And are you aware of, of, of this concept uh, being integrated into uh, other medical practices, or do you feel that you've been you're kind of the uh, uh, alone in it? No, I don't. I don't. I think there's some of the uh, um, when I've spoken spoken to a lot of the medical groups. I think some of them are. Um, I must admit, it's not everybody's kettle of fish, no. uh, and some physicians are just in the. And even when I. Uh, made my rounds at the, the hospital every morning, I would, when I was in my medical mode, I would sometimes forget to say to the patient, now don't forget you can phone and have a TV brought down to watch comedy movies right. because I was in the medical mode. Um, it, uh, it's, been, it's interesting that when I speak to medical groups, they're polite, 
uh, and they nod. Uh, but in the open, they won't get up and say it's good. But when I'm finished the talk, they'll come up to me and say, well, I didn't uh, want to say anything, but I think you're right. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> thanks for saying it's okay <laughs> you know, to do. Yeah. So you've done almost a thousand presentations yeah. since you retired on the, on, on the topic. So I have to ask you what, what, what what is it about this activity that that's meaningful to you, yeah. and and what what's in it for you? Yeah. What what do you get out of it? I think uh, for, first of all, just to see people laugh. Uh, I I did one group of lions and lionesses uh, north of here, where at the end of it, I had one of the women come up and say. I'm really mad at you. I have to go and change my underwear. Uh, and I thought, great, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, and I say, there's no harmful side effects to laughter unless you have a weak bladder or a full bladder. So that, uh, and you, you get them to uh, realize, and I, I do get some people that will come up afterwards and say, I am going to seek out more humor. Now, we don't even have video stores anymore, but for quite a while, the horror section was bigger than the comedy section. Yeah, yeah. And I tried to encourage people. Um, I also uh, <laughs> have a, a thing uh, called the humor profile where I ask people to sit down for a moment and think about where you laugh the most. It's usually not by yourself or they'll lock you up somewhere. <laughs> it's usually socially with other people. Right. It may be with a special friend. It may be with emails. It may be with uh, cartoon books. It may be with uh, TV sitcoms. Sure. So that if you can analyze where you laugh the most and you find yourself feeling down, you can purposely go to that avenue to try to make yourself feel better. Right. Um, I also ask people if they have a laughter buddy. They may have someone that they know they can share a joke with right. or a laugh with. Yeah. Uh, and you may want to pick up the phone and say, hey, I, you know, I'm having a bad day. Can you help me here? Right. Uh, I uh, also tell about the uh, doctor who phoned the patient to say, I've got good news and bad news. The patient said, I'm having a terrible day. Give me the good news first. The doctor says, well, the good news is you've got 24 hours to live. I says, if that's the good news, what's the bad news? He says, I forgot to phone you yesterday uh, uh, so that you can have some fun with it as well. Um, I, so it I, just makes you feel yeah. good when people yes. laugh. It's yeah, when they laugh. It's and it, it may be, it's not rocket science stuff, but for that particular period of time, they, they're they having fun. And uh, now we, we also like to point out to people the physiology of, of mirthful laughter and this goes back to a fellow named Max Weinstein that I heard speak at one of the Saratoga uh, uh, sessions. And he was he told about being a psychology student, university, one Saturday, helping some friends move a freezer up two flights of stairs. Halfway up the second flight, somebody cracked a joke, and they started to laugh. And they started to laugh harder, and they ended up dropping the freezer, and it smashed. But Max stood back and said, now, wait a minute here. I was holding that freezer. All my muscles were tight. I started to laugh. I knew I shouldn't let go, but I still let go. He said, wait a minute. Can we take the business executive who's uptight with migraines, cervical muscle spasm, lumbar spasm, stomach ulcers, make him laugh and force him to relax. Yeah. You cannot contract your skeletal muscles and laugh mirthfully at the same time. Oh. It's physiologically impossible. Awesome. I ask people too, if they're like me, if you make a trip to the first trip to Buckingham Palace and the guard is standing at attention, what do you do? Try to make them laugh because you can't stand at attention and laugh at the same time. So we've got the physiology, functional MRI, biochemistry. We've got the classification. And I think where I fit into it now is more in the uses of, of humor. And, and uh, I don't consider myself a stand-up comic. I don't consider myself necessarily an academic uh, that's done, you know, the very fancy double-blind studies, et right, cetera. Right. It's more a case of where is it now? I've had people say, well, have you bombed sometimes? Well, sure, sometimes that's going to happen. Quickly, you recognize it, apologize, and say, maybe we should start over again. Uh, but there, this these era of being politically correct has really put a, a dent in people opening <laughs> up. And, and, and unfortunately, some people are just like robots now because yeah. there's no humor, no fun whatsoever. Right, right. Ken, one of the, the the themes that we're working on in this podcast series is uh, is the term squeezing all the juice out of retirement, yeah. and it's yeah. pretty clear to me that that's yeah. what you're doing yeah. on an ongoing basis. But when you hear that phrase, what what, what does it mean to you? I, it means, I think, getting the most. Like, it's not sitting in front of the TV, uh, waking up at noon, 
Um, we, we know from medical stuff that having a routine, and I saw this with some of my patients that were unemployed. I would ask them, describe your normal day. Well, I sleep in till 10 or 11. I get up, have something to eat. I watch TV. Uh, and you realize that there's no structure to the day. There's no one depending on them to do something. And that that is detrimental to their health, basically. Where uh, we see a lot of the seniors in the group that were here, some of them are up at 6 o'clock in the, yeah. the, the gym here, working <laughs> out every single day. Yeah. They're walking, yeah. they're biking, etc. Yeah. And actually, I, I should mention, because I just picked it up, uh, Steve Jobs wrote an essay just before he died, and he talked about the six most important doctors. And the first uh, 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 doctor was sunshine, sunlight. And we know that 20 minutes a day out in the sunlight uh, increases serotonin levels, and we really recommend that for people. Yeah. Exercise, Guelph has a program called uh, Exercise is Medicine. Uh, rest when you need it, obviously. Diet, correct diet, uh, eating properly, self-confidence uh, in yourself. And I, I, I really push this when in my family practice, especially with teenage girls. The teenage girl who likes herself can't be pushed around. The one who doesn't, oh, come on, let's have some marijuana. Oh, here's some alcohol. Oh, here's some drugs. If they're self-confident, they say no. If they're weak, they say, oh, they won't like me if I don't do it, and boom, you're in trouble uh, right away. And then the, the uh, final one uh, was friends, socializing. Um, I just actually last this week read a little study saying that we men are way behind when we, in retirement. Um, I look at my wife's group of social friends, and it is amazing. A lot of men... No, they don't have a, if you asked who's your best friend, they may not have one or they may not communicate with them two or three times a year. Right. My wife had a good friend. Now she was a next door neighbor. They probably talked three or four times a day yeah. together. Now she's lost her, but they're realizing how important those social connections are for longevity and for health. And, uh, when you go into the nursing homes now, they're about 80, 90% female, and that's not because the males are out playing golf. No. The males are gone. Yeah. Uh, the women are living longer. Yeah. And we tend to make fun of those social contacts. And <clears throat> one of the uh, comments, I mean, they should have six hours of, of social uh, contacts a week. I figure my wife's done by noon on Monday. <laughs> uh, uh, and yet she's happy and it, yeah. it, it's good for them. Absolutely. And so that's something I would mentioned to seniors in retirement is to have a really good look at your social contacts and maintain them uh, because it is vital for your health. Another theme that we're working on, uh, Ken, is the idea of uh, uh, the suggestion that you don't retire, but that you rewire. Yeah. So yeah. when you hear that phrase, yeah. what, what does that mean for you? That How does means that to me that you keep learning. Um, we, uh, my wife has played bridge for 45 years. I didn't play for many years when I was working, uh, and on a call, etc. but I'm learning to play bridge again. We play a couple times a week rewiring. and that, that's rewiring. Keeping in mind. The other thing I did when I retired was my wife was in two book clubs and I formed a men's book club mm -hmm. and we've got nine of us. We've been going 12 years now. Uh, nobody has left. We meet once a month. Yep. Uh, we are doing, um, we're doing well. We've done over a hundred books now. Mm -hmm. uh, we usually pick a classic each each year, uh, and each fellow will pick a book that he would like to read. And yep. what it's done is it's got me to read some books that I never would have read otherwise, sure. uh, and learning uh, with them. I just finished yesterday because there's so much uh, talk about it. I want to know more about Ukraine, and there's a book called uh, Red Famine by Anne Applebaum, uh, and it's all about the history of Ukraine, mm -hmm. and and it was quite an eye opener when you read. Uh, the what's gone on with Poland and Germany and Russia and, and uh, what the, the Ukraine was, of course, the breadbasket of yeah, Europe yeah. Uh, and the famine of 1933, where they now are pretty sure three million people died of starvation in the breadbasket of Europe. Right. And it was man-made. Uh, Stalin took all the stuff, took it to Moscow for his troops and left these people to starve. And uh, so I, those kind of things I... Uh, We've, um, yeah. yeah, the uh, Jarrett Diamond uh, is a fellow who wrote uh, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, mm -hmm. Collapse. Yeah. Uh, 
um, those kind of uh, books. I really enjoy them and, and learn uh, a lot from them. So I always have a book on the go. I have a Kobo. I take it wherever I go yep. because if you've got to wait five minutes, you can still read. And if you've got a book to read, then you can't be bored. And you're rewiring. Yeah, rewiring. And final question. Yep. Uh, what? Uh, not that you don't have enough going on, yeah. but what, what plans do you have for yeah. the future? Well, I've had people ask me, am, am I interested in, or have I been thinking of writing a book? And I've been accumulating things over the last 30 years uh, so that, uh, yeah, I've got, uh, and I've, I just bought a, a new uh, smaller laptop that I've set upstairs. Uh, I like to be, walk, we, we go to Florida for uh, some of the, the winter, mm-hmm. and I have a situation there where I can sit and look out over the ocean uh, and write. And so this is something in my mind right now that I'd like to put some of these stories and things Mm -hmm. uh, into a a book uh, Mm -hmm. to see if uh, I can even reach more people. Now, whether I'll have to, I've got friends who've published books and they've self-published and, and, you know, I know it's a terribly competitive market, uh, but uh, it's uh, something that I'm thinking of doing and and, uh, just got sort of started on. A new project. Yeah. Good. If you'd like to connect with uh, Dr. Shonk and perhaps have him speak to a group, you can contact him at drkenshonk at gmail.com or his website, healthyhumor.ca. Ken, thanks very much for joining me today. You're very welcome, Riley. My pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed today's conversation and that you'll join us again next time as we help you squeeze all the juice out of retirement. I'm Riley Moynes. Bye for now.